citywide task force on the protections from housing discrimination. So today we have an information packed workshop for you prepared by our lovely presenter, Sam Yang from the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Just a little information about the commission. The New York City, yes, the New York City Commission on Human Rights is charged with the enforcement of the human rights law, which is title eight of the administrative code of the city of New York and with educating the public and encouraging positive community relations. The commission is divided into two major bureaus, the law enforcement and community relations. So if you would like to ask a question, please feel free to utilize the chat box. We will be taking your questions and I believe Sam will be answering them as the presentation goes on. So if anything comes up, feel free to ask. Um, if even anything about housing court answers, you can also ask, we can all communicate through the chat box, but please do keep your mics um, off while the, through the duration of the meeting. We would also like that you keep this space respectful, this conversation respectful and, and polite, no violent language, bigotry or hostility will be permitted or allowed. That goes without saying, but if you have any issues directly, you can message me. And if you enjoy this training, you can check out our website. We will be uploading this training, the recording of it onto our website, as well as sharing some information from the New York City Commission on Human Rights, if you wanna reach out to them and check out our other trainings that we will be having coming up in the following months. And so with that, without further ado, I'll let our presenter, Sam Yang, take it away. So go ahead, Sam, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Kayla. Um, thank you, Hassan Kaur Answer, for having me here today. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam Yang. I am the housing liaison for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Uh, let me just share my presentation. Here we go. Um, and as Kayla mentioned, you know, if you have any questions throughout this uh, workshop or presentation, feel free to put in chat box. I will check the chat box occasionally. So, you know, this presentation is designed to give you an overview and an outline of the commission and the human rights law. Um, if you have any specific questions, you want to file a complaint for you or on a, for a client uh, or for a family or friend, um, you know, the best thing to do is always get in touch with the commission directly. You can do that by calling us at 311 and asking to speak with the Commission on Human Rights. This is that. Um, so as Taylor mentioned, we have two main departments. One of them is the Community Relations Bureau, which does the, you know, we promote equality, understanding, mutual respect. Um, we do various workshops. We do various, you know, public-led programs, campaigns. Um, we work with many nonprofit groups um, as well as many other organizations. The main goal is to make sure that everyone in New York City understands about their rights when it comes to housing, employment rights, uh, public accommodation rights. So we wanna make sure that people know that if they were discriminated, they understand you know, where they can turn to for assistance. We are also a law enforcement agency. So we do have a law enforcement bureau. Um, the law enforcement bureau accepts complaints and initiate investigations. One of the special things about our agency is that if someone wishes to file an anonymous complaint, meaning that they don't want to use the name, they could file an anonymous complaint. With enough hints, our law enforcement bureau can actually file commission initiated cases. Um, so different from some other agencies is that we bring our cases to the city's office of administrative trials and hearings, um, rather than to the Supreme Court or to the civil court. So we also actually have two other divisions. Um, one of them is known as the Office of Mediation and Conflict Resolution. In the event if both parties wishes to mediate, um, our law enforcement bureau would then refer those cases to our Office of Mediation and Conflict Resolution. That office is independent from any other commission office to ensure neutrality. We also have the Office of the Chair, which issues final decisions, orders, legal enforcement guidances, rules and regulations. We also draft um, policies and legislation and engage in policy discussion with commission stakeholders. Um, when we say commission stakeholders, we're talking about anyone who is currently working in New York City, living in New York City, um, or even visiting New York City. You know, everyone is a commission stakeholder. If you have any questions, any comments, any needs, 
um, any protections that needs to be added on, you know, feel free to get in touch with us and let us know so we can add it on. In fact, you know, one of the newest protections that is going to be added in is going to be effective in March of 2022. So um, in two months, it will come in effect. And this protection is for home attendants, um, not just home attendants, but babysitters as well. Um, most domestic workers, um, they'll be protected, meaning that they can't be discriminated, sexually harassed, or unfairly treated because of their status as a home health aide, as a babysitter, and such. So what exactly does the human rights law do, right? So we prohibit discrimination in several areas. Um, employment, um, you know, where you work, uh, public accommodations, you know, where you go shopping, the store, uh, groceries, supermarkets, airports, um, housing, which we'll talk about today, which is a very important topic. Um, a lot of our cases are always around housing. Discrimination harassment, which is harassment, hate crime that occurs in public, as well as bias-based profiling by law enforcement. So in most cases, the last incident of discrimination must have occurred within the last year to file a complaint with the commission. So for, for example, in housing, your landlord evicted you on the premise of your sexual orientation. That individual will have one year to file a complaint with us. Now, if it's gender-based harassment, meaning that your super is sexually harassing you. Your landlord is saying, "Oh, I'll fix, you know, I'll fix your heater if you do, you know, something sexually explicit with me, right? We're going on a date with me." That is considered gender-based harassment, and those individuals have a time period of three years to file a complaint with us. So for everything else, it's one year. For gender-based harassment, sexual harassment cases, it's three years to file a complaint. Um, we are a city agency, so that means that we can only cover incidents that occur in New York City. So unfortunately, if you reside in Long Island, New Jersey, or you know, upstate New York, right, we don't have jurisdiction. We can't go after those landlords or those violators, right? We only have, um, we are only able to cover within the five boroughs. Individuals may also file a claim in court up to three years after the last discriminatory act instead of going to a law enforcement bureau. So if you don't want to come to us, that's fine. Or if the one year statute of limitation has passed you can always file a case with the court. So when we talk about discrimination um, under the city's human rights law, we try to make it as comprehensive as possible, as broad as possible. So, you know, for example, you know, the way we see it is discrimination is any unfair or unequal treatment of a person or group based on certain characteristics or membership in a protected class, such as race and color. In housing, there are 17 of these protected classes, which we'll talk about later. So again, it's any unfair or unequal treatment. Um, one tenant gets, you know, heat while you don't get heat. And it could be on the premise that, you know, they're of a particular race and you're not of that race. Or, you know, one tenant is getting priority when it comes to taking an apartment while you don't get priority for taking an apartment. The difference in treatment. Um, when we talk about discrimination, it could be multidimensional, it could be overt with subtle ways, right? Overt, um, it could be where landlords are just refusing to assist you because you rent an apartment using a voucher. Um, that could be subtle ways. Um, discrimination can occur in interpersonal, institutional, or structural relationships. So does New York City Commission of Human Rights ever work in conjunction with New York State Division of Human Rights? Um, yes, so we do work in conjunction sometimes. Um, however, one thing to note is that sometimes um, it depends on the protected class. Um, so one of the things is that if you file a complaint where you're working with one city agency or with one agency in general on a particular case, you can't bring up that case with another agency. So for example, if you go to a state division of human rights and say, hey, I was discriminated because I was using a voucher, right? You can't go to the city and say the same thing because the state will already be investigating that case. However, it could be that you were discriminated on two premises. One was on the fact that you had a voucher and the other was on the premise of your immigration status. So in that case, you could say, go to the state and say, hey, I was discriminated because I had a voucher. Then you could go to the city and say, hey, I was discriminated because of my immigration status. That works because it's two different uh, incidents, protected classes. One is voucher and one is immigration status. We also occasionally refer cases to the state as well if it's outside of jurisdiction. So for example, if it was Long Island, 
will say you should bring the case to the state division rather than us. Um, in order to establish discrimination under the New York City human rights law, there has to exist a certain relationship between the people involved. So there has to be an imbalance of power, uh, some sort of power dynamic. So in housing, it's usually with tenants and landlords, tenants with brokers, tenants with agents, the applicants with the realtors, right? Um, there is some sort of power imbalance because you know, in this instance, the landlord gets to dictate whether or not to evict the tenant. The landlord gets to dictate whether or not to increase the rent observably sometimes, right? Even though it's illegal, but they might do that. Um, so there is a power dynamic there. So these are the 17 protected classes in housing. Um, the first one is age. Um, whether you're 18 years old, 108 years old, right? Um, if you're looking for your first apartment, your second apartment, or your 20th apartment, um, you cannot be discriminated because of your age um, or your perceived age. So if you are 20, but you tend to look like you're 13, you know, landlords can say, oh, you look kind of young. So I'm gonna need your parent or your, you know, to come in and look at this apartment for you, right? So that would be discrimination, um, just on the premise of perceived age or perceived that someone is younger because of their looks. Landlords and realty, uh, real estate agents, um, brokers, they have to do everything similar to everybody. They can't just, you know, say you can't, you have to do this or you gotta bring additional person. You gotta pay extra money because of how you look or how young or old you might be. Um, because children are, maybe, or would be residing with such person or person. So if a landlord deters you because you have kids or you might have kids, you know, that is discrimination and it's illegal. Color, color of your skin. Um, disability. Actually, in New York City, um, disability is highly protected. Persons with disabilities have a lot of protection. If you have disability, if, a, if you're a person with disability, you do have the right to request for reasonable accommodation in housing. One thing to note is that with the city, which I'll talk more about disability later, um, which I'm really proud of our agency for that, is that with our law, the landlord is responsible to pay for any accommodation, not the tenant. Meaning that if you need a bathtub cut, a slit in the bathtub, or if you need to lower the shelf because of a disability, the landlord must pay for that renovation. The landlord has to pay for that cut in the bathtub. They can't pass on that bill to the, uh, to the tenants. Your gender, gender identity. So landlords cannot misuse of pronouns, meaning that even if your birth certificate says I'm a male, but you told the landlord, hey, I identify as female, my pronouns are she and her, landlord, super agents of the landlord must respect that pronoun and use she and her. If they misuse your pronouns on multiple occurrences, that can constitute as discrimination. Immigration or citizenship status. So unlike maybe some other cities or states in New York City, immigration or citizenship status does not matter when it comes to buying a house or renting an apartment. Um, landlords can't threaten an individual because of their immigration or citizenship status or perceived status. Law of sources of income, which is gonna be vouchers, we'll talk about later. There's a whole five slides on that. Um, law of occupation. So law of occupation is generally what the person does for work, the employment status. Um, if your work is lawful, so keyword is lawful, right? It has to be legal. Um, if it's a legal job, landlords can't say, I don't want you because of that. Um, certain, you know, things that landlords might bring up or agents might bring up is that, oh, you know, the landlords live on the first floor, they're renting out the second floor, they don't want any tenants that go to work early in the morning at like, you know, 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. You know, they want a tenant that works, you know, from nine to five, right? So in that instance, you know, you might say, hey, that's not really discrimination. That seems normal, right? But it could be discrimination because of someone's law of occupation. If I was a nurse, if I was a uh, sanitation, work for sanitation, I work for MTA, well, my job requires me to be there at work by 4 a.m. in the morning, you know, there's no way I could say, oh, yeah, like, you know, there's no way that I'm going to be able to wake up at 9 a.m. I'll be late for work, right? So these type of policies or ideas um, in place, also, at first, it seems okay, but it does, dis it does discourage individuals, certain individuals from applying for these apartments. So, you know, always keep that in mind, right? Um, some policies might seem okay, but 
it might still be considered discrimination because of how they discourage one particular group or other groups from applying. Um, your marital or partnership status, your national origin, um, sexual orientation, status as a victim of domestic violence, sexual violence or stalking, um, pregnancy. One of the things about pregnancy, people always, landlords always say is that you got to leave now because it's a silly apartment, you're pregnant, you can't stay here anymore, this is too small. Um, that is discrimination. They can't say that. They're not allowed to discourage individuals from staying because they're pregnant. Um, race religion or creed, and uniform service or military status. So these are the 17 protected categories in housing. Um, can it be landlord and prospective tenants? Yes, so it does work for landlords and prospective tenants. Um, applicants and landlords, so that is considered a relationship. In terms of immigration, can a landlord refuse a tenant based on not having a social security number or credit? Um, so credit is still a thing. So landlords can still request for credit scores and it can still deny individuals because of low credit or bad credit. Um, however, if you could prove in a sense that the lack of credit score um, was because of one of the other protected classes, um, then you can request the exemption. Um, the other thing is that, let me see. There are other things that landlords can request for rather than just the security numbers. They could ask for tax ID numbers as well. Um, so on our website, there's actually, we actually wrote something regarding about landlords uh, not having, like tenants not having security card numbers. What else can, can um, landlords request for these applicants? Um, certain things that could prove is that, you know, one year of uh, record of good rent payment, that could work, right? So if you don't have a, uh, credit score, you could show landlords like, hey, you know, I do have one year of good rent payment, and this is my proof. If you were, you know, in a situation of domestic violence where your partner was the one that kept all of the money, um, they were the one who pay all of the bills, everything, and now, you know, you were getting assaulted, so you left on the premise, you know, you could mention that saying, hey, I was at the status of domestic violence, that's why I don't have a credit score. And ask the landlord, is there anything else I could use to prove it, you know? or you know, show the landlord that there is proof that I'm consistently working to better improve my credit score or, um, and such. So there's always some ways around it um, when it comes to credit scores. But you know, if you're not sure, if you have more questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us um, and we can try to like, talk to you more about what other things can be, can be done. Okay. So housing providers must comply with the human rights law. Um, it is unlawful to discriminate in private and public housing, land and commercial space. Um, private housing would be the market rate apartments. We have, you know, the mom and pop, um, small rentals, two units, three units, four units. Um, we also deal with public housing. Public housing can be NYCHA. Public housing can also be some of the HPV affordable housing units as well. Um, so, any person who is selling, renting, or leasing, including landlords, superintendents, building managers, brokers, and realtors, um, cannot discriminate because of a person's actual or perceived protective status under the law. And when we say any person, we're also including any agent of the landlord, whether or not they are certified. So for example, if I was renting out an apartment um, and I asked my brother-in-law from Florida, right, who resides in Florida to help me out with this. Um, if my brother-in-law would have no idea about housing law in New York City, make any type of comments, judgments, or statements that discourage someone from applying, I, me, and my brother-in-law can both be held liable under the law. So, you know, um, we can't use, oh, he didn't know the law. Or we can't say, you know, we have no idea that this law existed as an excuse to discriminate. So. So again, it's any person and any agent, whether or not to certify. Um, there are some exceptions to the human rights law. So one of them is a uh, two families residence right, where the owner or member of the owner's family occupies one of the units. This exemption under the New York City human rights law applies only if the landlord and owner has not advertised. So what this generally means is that if I own a two unit house, 
I lived in the first unit, I want to rent out the second unit. Um, if I didn't advertise the second unit, I could pick and choose whoever I want to rent out to. Meaning that if I didn't advertise the second unit, I could, you know, say, pick an Asian person to live in there. I could pick only guys to live in the second unit. It's up to my discretion. Um, however, the moment I did advertise, whether it's through Facebook Marketplace, Trulia.com, Street Easy, or even go through a third party certified professional like a broker or manager, uh, broker or real estate agency, or if I put any type of for rent signs on anywhere in the public, on my, you know, on my door, on my window, or on the phone post, right? That's considered as advertisement. Once I did that, I lose that privilege. So perfect example would be that if you ever went to a broker and you had a voucher and the broker is saying, oh, this is a two family house. They don't have to take vouchers. That is actually incorrect. The fact that they went through a broker means that that two family has advertised. And once they had advertised, they lose any type of privileges um, or any type of exception. They can no longer say they don't want any more vouchers anymore. Um, rental of room. So another exception is rental rooms in a housing accommodation where the rental is made by the owner and the owner or family member resides there. So room rental situation. If I have a spare bedroom, um, I have the right to rent my bedroom to whoever I want to. Um, the reason why this is an exception is really because of safety reasons. Um, there will be shared, you know, living room, shared kitchen, shared bathroom. So we want to make sure that people are comfortable with each other. Um, Housing limited to seniors or persons with disabilities, so pretty straightforward, right? Um, there are certain housings that's limited to seniors or persons with disabilities. So they can't say, you know, this is only for seniors or this is only for persons of 65 or older. Same thing with housing specifically uh, built for persons with disabilities. And the last exception is gender uh, specific dormitory residence. So, Question is, how can a client prove it was discrimination? For example, they found out that they had a voucher when they reply, I am sorry, we rented to someone else. That's a great question. So we actually get that a lot, especially with uh, when it comes to vouchers, right? So we usually, there's two types of testing with two types of ways to identify discrimination. One of them, particularly for this one, is known as comparative testing. So what we do is we have testers, or if the client is okay with it, or if you're okay with it, um, if you're helping someone, you can also test out for the client. You know, the client says, oh, I call into this broker and I told them I had a voucher and they say they rent it out to someone else. Now, if you call in and say you had, you know, income and the broker saying, oh, this apartment is still available, then we have the difference in response and we can use that, that comparative testing you know, saying that this, this was discrimination and it did happen. So, yeah, so that's comparative testing. Um, so we do use that. So, yeah, so if you did call in and that did happen, you know, let us know about it and we can use that to do intervention work. Intervention meaning that we'll try our best to reach out to the brokers, uh, the realtors or the landlord to inform them about the law. Um, but, you know, sometimes they still refuse. At that point, we will probably penalize them more higher than usual as punishment. Okay. So who can be held liable? Landlords, superintendents, rental uh, managing agents, real estate brokers and agents, newspapers, lending institutions, insurance companies, and appraisers. So, so the next few slides, we'll talk about law to income. Um, I would say a good 30% or more of our cases is going to be unlawful source of income. Um, as of February 15, 2021, the law was expanded to make most New York City rental properties subjected to New York City human rights law, uh, human rights law, uh, law source of income protection, regardless of the number of units in the property. property. So local source of income includes any form of federal, state, or local government housing assistance, whether it's cash or a voucher. Um, Section 8, city set, set, HASA, GI Bill, um, these are just some forms of local uh, sources of income. 
Lawful assistance income can also be income derived from Social Security, child support, alimony, and foster care subsidies. It can include vouchers for security deposits, one-time emergency vouchers, or rental assistance vouchers. Perfect example of one-time emergency vouchers will be HRA one-shot deal. So if a client is applying for the one-shot deal, landlords can't say, I don't want to fill out the paperwork for the one-shot deal, or I don't want to submit my W-2 form for the one-shot deal. Um, they can't do that. Landlords must fill out those paperwork. They're not allowed to charge additional money to fill out any paperwork as well. Yeah, so if you have any clients that say, you know, I'm trying to apply for the one-shot deal, but my landlord's saying, oh, he'll do the paperwork, but he was going to charge me $50 to fill it out, that is actually illegal, and it is considered discrimination. Um, so again, you know, Section 8, HASA, City Fed, SSI, SSDI, GI Bill, um, these are all considered as sources of income. Any advertisement that says no vouchers, or cash only or employment required um, can be considered as discrimination and are illegal. So when it comes to lawful source of income, uh, a landlord or broker with the right to sell rent with lease cannot refuse to rent an apartment because the prospective tenant receives public or housing assistance including section eight. So pretty straightforward, right? Um, landlords can not say, you know, we don't wanna take section eight. Well, we don't wanna take city bus. We don't wanna work with anyone with vouchers. Um, they can't say, you know, oh, I had a bad experience with someone with a voucher before. That's why I don't want them. Even if the landlord has bad experience, um, they can't deny, they can't say we don't want anyone else with vouchers. Refuse to process renewal paperwork. So not just renewal paperwork, but just paperwork in general. And this also includes the inspection. Um, even if the inspection took about two months, unfortunately, landlord still has to go through the process. They can't say it's taking too long. Um, I don't want to work with you anymore. Um, we actually just we actually did have a case where the landlord actually had to submit the lease four times. Um, they had to review and sign the lease four times because certain corrections needed on the lease. The landlord can't say, we don't want to do that anymore. They have to do it. They have to make the correction. Um, one of the corrections usually needed on the lease is the late fees, particularly when it comes to city sets. Um, late fees cannot be included in the, in the lease. So landlords usually have to remove it. Um, some landlords are saying reluctant, but unfortunately, you know, because they have to remove it if it's requested by uh, DHS and it's requested by the program. So. Okay, so refuse to do repairs for voucher holding tenants, but thus repairs for non voucher holding tenants. The easiest way to know about this again is if you know you have a client that has a voucher, uh, making sure that they document when they got in touch with the landlord. Their heater was out of service. It's cold, right? The heater doesn't work. Uh, make sure they write down, you know, on January 5th, um, I spoke to a landlord about my heater needing to be fixed. Um, and the landlord says he'll come to me in about five days to fix it. You know, and then you speak with your neighbors, your neighbors who might not be using a voucher, you know, ask them, hey, has the landlord come to fix your heater? Um, the neighbor would be like, yeah, you know, I just called them to fix it today on January 6th and you know, they came right away to fix it, right? In that instance, you do have that disparate treatment, that comparison right there. The landlord saying you need five days to fix yours while your neighbor who's paying with cash only needs one day, well, less than a day to fix it. So in that instance, you know, that could be discrimination. Um, refuse to rent an apartment unless the prospective tenant earns 40 times the rent. So we hear this a lot, right? 40 times the rent, 30 times the rent. You gotta make $68,000 minimum. You gotta make $102,000 minimum to rent this apartment. As long as your voucher amount covers the rent um, and sometimes the utilities, you don't have to make 40 times the rent. So if the rent is for $2,000 and your voucher is for $2,100, um, you don't need to have any type of income. Like you, got, you don't have to make 40 times the rent. You don't have to make $80,000 a year. As long as that voucher is above or similar to the rent amount, you're good to go. 
So yeah, so any times they say we don't want you or we can't rent to you because of your income, that's totally a lie, it's illegal, they cannot say that. Uh, print advertisement, including online or newsletter ads indicating refusal to accept vouchers or subsidies. And one of the, and the last one is, which is actually quite special, um, require credit checks when the voucher covers the entire rent and utilities. So what this means is that if the landlord is renting apartment for $2,100, which includes utilities, utility fees, and the tenant has a voucher for $2,200, and the tenant doesn't have a portion, meaning that they don't contribute anything, credit check scores are not required. Meaning that even if the tenant has a poor credit score or no credit score, landlords can't use that excuse or reasoning to deny the tenant the apartment. Um, the reason behind this protection is that, you know, credit checks are used to determine how well someone pays rent on time or someone, how someone pays uh, bills on time, right? However, if that individual isn't paying anything and the city is paying the whole amount, how great or how bad they pay something on time doesn't matter. So, you know, if the voucher covers entire rent utilities, even if they have a no credit score, those clients, those tenants, those applicants, should not be discouraged or you know, pointed away because of the credit score. If they did, you know, again, get in contact, uh, get in contact with the Commission of Human Rights. So, can a landlord deny a tenant uh, housing on the basis that the prospective tenant is not lawfully authorized to work in the US due to immigration status? No, they can't. So again, immigration status doesn't matter. Um, as long as, in fact, any type of photo ID works as proof of identification. So if they have a New York City ID, that is actually proof of identification. Um, but yeah, so in general, no, they can't deny someone because they're not lawfully authorized to work in the US. It, again, immigration status doesn't matter. Um, if the landlord does deny it, with the landlord saying, oh, I see that you have a notarized letter from your boss saying how much you're getting paid, um, I can't use that. I got to have a pay stub, right? Um, that could be, that tenant can actually technically file a complaint with the commission human rights on that basis. Because it's technically discouraging them. Um, they don't have a pay stub. They just have, they're getting paid in cash, right? Um, it's refusing to rent to someone at 40 times the rent for all prospective tenants or only those with vouchers. Uh, so this is only for those with vouchers. So they can still have the 40 times rent requirement, um, or they can still have that individuals make a minimum of $68,000 or $108,000. Um, that's legal. It's just that when it comes to vouchers, they can have that requirement. Um, the reasoning behind that is that if someone is using a voucher, most likely or not, they will not be making 40 times the rent. So. So more examples of lawful source of income discrimination, um, discouraging tenants with a voucher from applying for an apartment using phrases such as, we don't take payments from this program. Don't you have any other income? Okay, that program is fine, but can someone else guarantee the rent? Um, we will take that program, but you have to pay first month's rent, the grade deposit, and a broker's fee in cash up front. Section eight, taking too long to inspect the apartment. I have to rent it to someone else. So, yeah, these are all discouraging statements. Um, if you do have a program that does pay first month rent with security deposit or broker's fee, um, meaning that most programs do, um, landlords and brokers can request that money upfront. But they can say, you know, I can rent to you, but you have to pay me, you know, $7,500 for security deposit and first month rent right now. Um, they can do that. They have to go through with whatever is stated on the program and follow it, the guidelines. So if the guidance says you'll get your first month's rent, you know, two months in, they'll get their first month's rent two months in. Same thing with broker's fee. If the program says that the broker's fee is 15% of the annual um, rent, brokers can't say, oh, my fee is $5,000, 15% is too little, you have to pay the difference in cash. That's not how it works. Um, brokers will have to just take the 15%. They can request for more money. They cannot request for more money. Uh, 
Um, regardless of the number of units in the building, landlords must accept rental subsidies if the apartment is rent control and the tenant lives there when the law took effect in March 2008. So more protections, right? Um, a housing provider cannot pick and choose which foster programs they accept. Um, they cannot require additional payments or add-on. They cannot demand a broker's fee, even though the program provides bill reimbursement. They cannot charge a higher rent to a tenant with a less desirable voucher. And they cannot negotiate a side deal outside the terms of the rental agreement. Um, credit checks and application fees are allowed unless applied differently among applicants. So that was law proposals of income. There's a lot of information there. Um, so if you have any questions, you know, feel free to put it in the chat box. So other types of housing discrimination that we do witness a lot is, you know, the refusing to sell rent, um, to sell rent with lease housing because of someone's identity, uh, misrepresenting the availability of housing. So if you were ever turned down for an apartment, or if someone told you the apartment is no longer available and you believe the reason is because of your age, your race, your national origin, your marital status, partnership status, again, feel free to get in contact with the Commission of Human Rights. Um, we could do a testing. You know, we could test whether or not, we could test and figure out whether or not the apartment is really unavailable or if they're just denying you because of your identity. Um, setting different terms, conditions, or privileges for the sell, rental, or lease of housing, provide different housing services or facilities, posting discriminatory uh, advertising or marketing, refusing to provide a reasonable accommodation for a person with disability, steering a potential home buyer or renter to or away from a particular area, and pressuring for private homeowners to sell by exploring ethnic, racial, or other demographic changes. Um, when it comes to buying a house, any type of unlawful lending and credit practices, including you know, such as refusing to make a mortgage loan to a qualified applicant, refusing to provide information regarding a loan or imposing different terms or conditions on a loan or credit card, um, such as different interest rates, points or fees, all considered as discrimination. All right. Um, yeah, so that was a lot of information. Um, so the next part um, is gonna be about reasonable accommodation housing. So as I mentioned, um, local social income is usually about 30% of the cases that we do receive. Um, reasonable accommodation, we do receive about another 30% or 35%. So under the New York City Human Rights Law, a person with disabilities are entitled to reasonable accommodation. And disability can mean any physical, medical, mental, or psychological impairment or a history or record of such impairment. Um, so the definition of disability under the city law is very broad, it's very progressive, it's very comprehensive. Um, a lot of things are considered as disabilities, right? What we might think is not um, it, for us, right? For someone else with it, it might be. So that's why we want to make sure that it's very comprehensive and it covers a lot of things. So reasonable accommodation is to accommodate the needs to ensure that the tenants um, have meaningful access to enjoy a housing unit or a public accommodation. Um, can be structural involving architectural modification or can involve policy or rule changes. Um, the accommodation should not cause any undue hardship to a housing or public accommodation provider. Um, the reason why we're saying this again is because under the city's law, the housing provider must pay for that accommodation. If you need a ramp, if you need a chairlift, if you need a uh, lowering the shelves, a different fridge, the housing provider has to pay for that accommodation. The housing with public accommodation provider has the burden of proving the undue hardship. So if a tenant says, you know, I'm using a wheelchair, I need a ramp, I can't go out the, the steps without by myself. Um, you know, I don't want anyone to help me go out the steps. I want to do it myself. I'm requesting for a ramp. That housing provider must buy the rent or prove that they cannot pay for it. Um, the commission determines if the accommodation request constitutes undue hardship by looking into, among other things, such as the nature and cost of accommodation, 
the financial resources of the building, the so tax records, financial statements, depreciation, and any documents covering revenue and expenses. So even if the building says, you know, this is under hardship, we, the Commission on Human Rights, get to determine whether or not it is. So when we find out that it is an undue hardship, you know, we will make them pay for it, make the landlord pay for the accommodation. Um, so in order, the way it works when it comes to requesting for reasonable accommodation is that a good faith dialogue by which the housing provider and a person entitled to accommodation, the tenant, must first, you know, engage in the conversation, engage in that dialogue. The person with a uh, disability must request the needs, um, the alternatives of the request accommodation and the difficulties that such potential accommodations might pose for the housing provider. So basically the individual would just kind of list down all of the things that's needed, right? So if someone is in the wheelchair, they might be saying, oh, the lobbies have two steps. I can't get through the lobby, so I am requesting for you know a ramp. Uh, my doorknobs are a bit too high, so I'm requesting for you to lower the doorknobs. Um, I can't get to my bathtub, so I'm requesting for a walk-in shower. My you know there is no bathroom grab bar, so you know I have difficulty using the bathroom, right? So requesting bathroom grab bars. Um, the stoves are too high. I need the stove to be lowered. So these are all types of accommodations can be requested. Um, the housing provider then will say, okay, I can provide this, this, or this. Um, I can also provide this about turning. The accommodation needed must be requested by the applicant or a resident with disabilities. And again, the law requires that the landlord pay for it. So, you know, some common barriers faced by persons with disabilities in housing, you know, steps at primary entrances to the building, either interior or exterior, inaccessible paths of travel into the building, uh, no handrails or steps. We actually have a workshop that is specifically talks about, you know, what are some barriers and what are some fixes for, you know, what are some examples of accommodation, basically for persons with disabilities in housing. Um, no handrails and steps, doors that are too narrow or too heavy, stairways leading to laundry rooms or mailboxes with no alternate paths, bathtubs that are too difficult to enter. Um, no grab bars by the toilet when the bathtub, uh, pet policies that prohibit service and emotional support animals. So if someone has an uh, emotional support animal or if someone has a service animal, um, even if the building has a no pet policy, that individual can still bring those animals into the building. They just have to request it. Um, one thing about service animals is that, um, generally speaking, only two questions are allowed by the landlord. No documentation will prove it's needed. So if you have a service animal, all you, the landlord can only ask you if it is a service animal and what duty, role, what job, what task has this animal been trained to do. Um, that's pretty much it. They can't ask for any certifications or documents showing that it is a service animal. Um, lack of accessible parking spaces, no sign language interpreters at co-op board meetings, elevators that break down frequently or are out of service for renovation. So if you realize that your elevators are breaking down frequently and you do need the elevator to go up and down the stairs, um, whether you have a bad leg, whether you're using a wheelchair, any type of walking assistance, you do have the right to request accommodation. Um, accommodations could be you know, moving you to a hotel room while that elevator is getting fixed or moving you to the first floor, um, or moving you to a different uh, building that doesn't have broken elevators. So these can be some requests. So examples of reasonable accommodations, um, installing interior or exterior ramps at the building to provide wheelchair access, installing grab bars or handrails in bathrooms, permitting service animals, installing electronic doors, permitting a tenant who has depression or anxiety to have an emotional support animal in their home, despite the building's no pet policy. So this is just an example, right? We have um, we have a step. So you know, for some individuals, this might be easy to just walk up the step. But if someone's in a wheelchair or walking assistance, um, that step is a barrier. So what happened is that the tenant requested for a ramp to be built, and the landlord has to apply um, and basically build a ramp. Um, this is an example of an interior ramp. 
Um, and in the event, if there is not enough space, you know, lobby list can be a uh, turn list. What it looks like. And I cannot play that. All right, let's move on. <laughs> so this is actually a video about an individual that was originally um, the individual was using a wheelchair and had difficulty going in and out of the building by himself. Usually he needs a relative, a friend, or the home health aid assist. Um, so the Lano was reluctant and was used to build a ramp. So we got involved and Basically, the landlord had to build a ramp, and now you know this individual is able to go in and out of the building by themselves without the need of any external assistance. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if the landlord says that you know I don't want to build a ramp, you know you have family members that can help you out, or they say oh I'm not going to build a ramp, you know just call this number and someone will come you know take you out of the building. That's not uh that's not a reasonable accommodation, you know that tenant should be able to go in and out do the things they gotta do by themselves without the need of external assistance. Um, if the tenant wants external assistance, you know, that's up to them. But if they don't want it, again, they don't, they should be able to do all these things by themselves. Um, one of the things about reasonable accommodation uh, for persons with disabilities and housing is that landlords can request for medical documentation. So if you do have a disability, landlords can request for medical documentation or a medical letter, a letter from a medical professional to be specific, stating why a certain accommodation requested. The letter doesn't have to state the disability, it just has to state or recommend a certain accommodation to be needed. So example would be that, you know, this person, I have, you know, I am a doctor at X, Y, and Z hospital. Um, I have been seeing this patient for three years. Um, based on this person's disability, um, I am recommending that, you know, you allow this individual to have uh, emotional support animal in the building. Um, I believe that the emotional support animal would be very beneficial for their health. That's it. That's what the letter has to say. Um, and that letter should be enough for the landlord to use um, to allow that emotional support animal into the building. So the other thing that we also deal with is known as tenant harassment. So this is kind of like a small portion of our protections, um, but it does go a long way. So the difference between the tenant harassment that we deal with and the ones that might be done when you go to housing court to file a housing court action is that for our, the only thing that we can do for tenant harassment is that it has to be related to the human rights law meaning that it has to be connected to the protected classes, the race, the age, the disability, and the mistreatment by the owner or landlord. So for example, you know, if the landlord is saying, oh, um, well, if the landlord is selling to buy heat because of the tenant's age, you could file a complaint with the commission of human rights. However, if the landlord is selling to buy heat because the tenant has been paying rent for a while, unfortunately, that's not something we can handle with. Um, you will have to go to housing court for that or call 311 for that um, with HPD. Yeah. So examples of tenant harassment, you know, intimidating tenants to move out of their apartment or surrender their rights because they are African-American, selling to provide adequate heat because the tenant has children, selling to provide water because the tenant has a disability, you know, threatening to call the police or immigration to force the immigrant tenant to vacate their apartment uh, for any to assault a tenant because of their sexual orientation um, or filing unfound housing court cases because of a tenant's status as a victim of domestic violence um, to intimidate them into leaving the apartment. We, we actually had a bunch of cases when it comes to, you know, landlords threatening the tenants with police or immigration. So if you know any clients that, you know, they might have been cursed out what they might have to threaten with, um, do let us know about it and we are actually able to go after those, um, go after those landlords. Um, one thing to know is that it doesn't matter if the tenant is paying rent, it doesn't matter if the tenant is late on rent, it doesn't matter if the tenant has a lease or not, as long as they're residing in the building, um, they're considered as a tenant um, and they do have all the protections and rights. So, you know, even if they're not paying rent, but the landlord are saying, hey, you know, get out when we're calling immigration on you, 
you they could still file a complaint with the Commission of Human Rights. Um, retaliation. So it is an additional violation of law for housing providers to retaliate or take adverse action against a tenant for opposing discrimination, reporting or filing a complaint of discrimination internally or externally, or cooperating, assisting, or participating in investigation, proceeding, or hearing uh, related to the actions prohibited under the New York City Human Rights Law. So some examples of retaliation are you know, blacklisting tenants, um, refusing to make repairs. You know, we kind of hear that a lot, right? They're like, oh, I am, you know, you have a case on me with the Commission of Human Rights. Um, I don't want to make any repairs, or I don't want to do any, you know, fixes until the case is settled, right? Um, that's considered as retaliation. Refusing to renew leases or intimidating tenants, saying, hey, you know, if you better take down the, you know, you better take down the case, or hey, you better not talk to the Commission of Human Rights. You better not act as a witness. You know, these are all um, forms of intimidation. With forms of retaliation. So the commission can impose $125,000 in civil penalties for violations and up to $250,000 for violations that result in willful one time women's misconduct. The civil penalties go to the city. Um, I don't get that money. Um, the agency doesn't get the money, so the city gets that money. However, the tenant who does file a complaint can receive um, other forms of remedy. You know, so this could be getting the tenant into the unit. If you have someone with a source of income, the landlord saying, I don't want you, you know, we could intervene, call the landlord and get the tenant into that building if possible. Mandating landlord to attend training, damages for victims for emotional distress and other out-of-pocket expenses related to the discrimination. Your elevator was out of service for a long time. You are using a walking assistant. You gotta, you can't go into your apartment because the elevator is out of service. <coughs> So you stay in a hotel room for that duration, right? That's out-of-pocket expenses that we could potentially assist you with getting back from the, um, from the landlord, including any other emotional distress damages as well. So the best way to contact the commission is by calling 311 and ask for the Commission of Human Rights or call our info line at 212-416-0197. Um, you can see our website for more information. Uh, we have one page guide for employers, housing, and public accommodation providers. Uh, if you're going to ask questions and legal guidance, you know, you can also learn more at our website at nyc.gov slash human rights. Yes. Okay, so, thank you so much, Sam, for that. And everyone, if you have any questions, feel free to put your questions down in the chat. Um, but yes, that was absolutely informative. And Sam, you said that there is information about this on the New York City Commission's website? Yeah, so all of the information is actually on our website. Um, let me go back. If you go to nyc.gov slash human rights, um, we have like a communications pa community page where you can request for workshops, but they also have like publications of all of our, our laws, our guidelines, our one pages and such. Um, so I think some of it was like fact sheets. So if someone's a voucher, there's like a fact sheet for landlords and a fact sheet for tenants. They can actually look at that to know about like what are their rights and what are their obligations and responsibilities. And but if, it's all on our website. Thank you. And if folks on here wanted to get in contact with you, how would they be able to do that? Um, sure, so I could put my information in the chat box. And as for the question, so there isn't a copy of the PowerPoint itself, but we have recorded this, um, this presentation and we will be putting it on our Housing Court Answers website underneath where the events are. So you could go back and take a look at it, share it around with other folks if you think they'd be interested in, and also do stay in tune for our upcoming trainings. It'll be coming uh, this week, next week, and for the rest of the year. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, just one last thing to note is that, um, so this is generally our commission complaint process. So if someone does call us, our info line, where you should do an intake to determine whether or not it's jurisdictional, meaning that they'll determine whether or not the case is within New York City and if it is discrimination or not. Um, 
the thing to know again, similarly, when we do an investigation and if we stated that there is no probable cause, um, that client should appeal the process. They have 30 days to appeal. Once that 30 day has passed, they can no longer file the case again with any other agency, with any other court system. So yeah, so unfortunately that's kind of how it works, right? So make sure that if there is no probable cause, they appeal it. Or before the investigation is completed, they request for withdrawal so they could take the case with somewhere else. And Sam, how long do these processes usually last, would you say, an estimate? So it kind of really does depend on the case and what happens. Um, there's going to be a lot of back and forth. So if they go to mediation or they go to conciliation, usually it could finish as fast as two months or even less, or even like, you know, two to six months. But if it does go to um, a court hearing, you know, it depends on the judge's availability. Um, and those could last like two years or three years sometimes. So we've had cases which have been going on for three years. Um, and of course, you know, they could also be appeals, which could take even longer. But yeah. And despite that, what are some of the benefits or what are the motivations that people might have to actually make a complaint about their discrimination instead of just moving on with it? Well, the first thing is, so with us, it's free. Um, you don't have to pay any money to buy a complaint with us. Um, the other thing is that not only does this provide protection for the tenant, but it also provides protection for the next individual. So that way that we have in our records um, and we can make sure that, you know, going forward, someone else who's applying for the exact same apartment won't be discriminated the same way as they were. So, you know, not only are you helping yourself, but you're also helping the person next to you, um, after you as well. But also, you know, we don't want any bad players to continue being bad. So we want to make sure that people understand that, you know, if you do violate the law, you will get punished. Um, we don't want people to think like, oh, you know, like I could discriminate however much I want and it's fine. I think we have a question. Oh, who initially decides whether or not my claim is considered discrimination? Um, so, when you, so when you do the intake, when you call us first, um, our info line staff will determine whether or not it's jurisdictional. And our legal team, our attorney, will be assigned to your case. And that attorney will do the investigations and determine whether or not it is discrimination or not. So yeah, so if this happens to you, um, let me know about it and I can figure out what exactly happened with your case um, and how to assist. So you have my email, which I'll send again, gn at cchr. So this is my email. Um, just let me know um, your name, your phone number, um, and specifically what happened in the case. I can look it up and see whether or not there's any information on it. Um, and what I can do is I could help you skip the process by just directly giving it to one of the, um, the supervisors there rather than going through the info line. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sam. This, this training was extremely informative. Um, I know it was helpful for me. And I see this, especially working in the housing court and talking with tenants, uh, you, you see discrimination happening in, in the most, the most casual ways. We'll talk to tenants who are looking for new apartments in a holdover case, and then you mention how they can't find new apartments. And it's because, um, oh, I have a voucher and the, the house right. director, they don't wanna take vouchers or, oh, they didn't like that I had too many kids. It's very common and people don't realize that it's not gonna be so blatant discrimination, but it could be just something as simple as, oh, you have a voucher, no, no, thank you, never mind. That's still discrimination. And we all have rights in the city and we need to enforce them to the most of our abilities. The landlords get enough, get away with enough. <laughs> And with that, so that concludes our training. Like we said, uh, this training has been recorded and will be uploaded to our Housing Court Answers website if you would like to revisit it or share it around with any other folks. Um, on January 